Tia's friend. Bishop T. DJ. Seem like he just don't come this way enough. It's no need for me to bore you about who he is and what he's done and where he's been and how many TV stations he's on. But I'm so glad that I knew him when he had some hair. <laughs> Way back about 25, going on 30 years at least now. This man of God used to come when we were on Broad Street. Under the late Pastor Benjamin Smith. And would just preach till, you know those folks used to talk about when you had old time church. And he would preach until we would shout and dance. Then after we shouted and danced, he'd preach some more till we'd go to boohooing and weeping and wailing. Then he'd preach some more and we'd go back and dance. That's what you call old time church. Hey, hallelujah. But he's here tonight. And I want you to put your hands together and bless God for this man of God from the Powers House in Dallas, Texas, Bishop T.D. Jakes. Come on and put those hands together and bless him. Come on, put those hands together and give God some praise, Philadelphia. Praise him like you don't care who sees you tonight. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And then he got happy and hollered, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name. I could do it by myself, but let's get together. Let's get together, everybody on your row and everybody in the balcony and everybody sitting in the back and everybody you brought with you. Let's get together and exalt his name. You got the throw down church folks in here tonight. You may be seated in his presence. your neighbor and say something's going to happen in here tonight. Just a moment, if I would, and if I can tonight, and, and tell you how deeply honored I am. I don't travel as much as I used to. Uh, I, it's, I don't get out as much as I used to in terms of traveling from church to church. I've been kind of busy with my own, and uh, I don't get out quite as often as I used to. And uh, I hadn't been to Philly for a while. And the devil said, uh, if, if you come to Philly, they forgot you. But when I pulled up on the parking lot, and it looked like they were giving away free cheese in here. I 
said somebody still remembers me in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, I love you with the love of Jesus. And I'm so honored and so glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And I know it's old-fashioned and out of style, but that's still true. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, Hallelujah, I thank God. Glory to God. Some 37 years ago, he saved me and delivered me and for the last 35 years I've been preaching the word of God and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Can you say amen? amen. And I want to honor the, this great pastor tonight, Pastor Spaulding for his faithfulness and his commitment and for his integrity come on let's bless God for the man of God and for the woman of God that stands beside him let's celebrate her his family and the family of deliverance evangelistic church opening up their doors and saying come on in you can praise the Lord over here what a mighty church I thank God for you and all of the staff that when I come, it really throws the church into quite a bit of drama. <laughs> Amen. So I, I salute the staff for the long hours and extra phone calls and, and all the saints that you're hosting tonight and, and the ain'ts. The saints are okay, but then you got to take in the ain'ts too, you know, and <laughs> mama and him. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I'm, I recognize your sacrifice and long hours and, and all that you are doing, and I just thank God for you. Can you say amen? amen. Well, they have been running me to death, y'all. I have been jumping around like some of you would not believe. I've been all over Los Angeles and uh, all up in Seattle, Washington, and and coming back down, going to Denver, and uh, just left New York and leave here going to Macon, Georgia. And from Macon, Georgia, I'm going to drop one suitcase and pick up another suitcase and come up in Atlanta and going to Chicago. And uh, I don't run like that no more. I ain't run like that since I had a jerry curl. <laughs> you remember my jerry curl? I get happy and they thought it was anointing, but it was juice. But I am, I am on an assignment. The Lord, for the last, oh, about a year and a half or so, the Lord had me shut in talking to my soul about something that he wanted to do for his people. And, uh, and I began to write and I began to journal and I began to study and I began to research and, and the Lord began to speak into my spirit and in my heart about a subject that I may have touched on in my life but really did not delve into in the area of forgiveness. And um, I, it ended up with me writing this book, Let It Go. Uh, I, I, I am really convinced, amen, that, that the Holy Spirit is, is grieved uh, in, in many ways because we have been up under attack in an invisible way, not just a visible way, in an invisible way. Sometimes you can survive what's going on on the outside better than you can survive what's going on. <laughs> on the inside. And I, I just wanted a moment to a little time to spend with you tonight. To 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 just just share with you some things and, and really 
to stir up your mind. And, and, and I, I tell you something. I like to have church. Y'all know I like to have church as much as anybody. Amen. I still dance a little bit every now and then. It's not quite as long as it used to be. <laughs> and it takes a little bit more to get me out there to do it. But I, I still believe in praising the Lord. But I have seen in 35 years people dancing over pain and burdens and struggles and oppression and anguish to the degree that because of the trauma that we have incurred in life, rather than to use our faith to fuel our dreams, we have used it to anesthetize our pain, to, to tranquilize whatever went wrong. And, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. God did not really come to replace your drug addiction, to replace alcoholism, to become your drug of choice, to get you high enough that you forget the hell you have back at the house. Nor did he come that we might have church. Jesus didn't say, I come that you might have church. He said, I come that you might have life. <laughs> High five somebody and say life. life. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I want to have. I want to have life. 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 I'm too old not to have life. If I don't have some life right now, when am I going to have some life? Come on, talk to me, somebody. I got I to gotta have some life. I got to have some peace and some joy. Y'all don't hear what I'm talking about. I don't, I, I'm like Mary J. Blige. I know it ain't a gospel song, but I agree with it. I don't need no more drama. Yeah, I don't need no more drama. I've had my share of drama and somebody else's share. I think I had a double portion of drama. Can, can you say amen, somebody? And so I want to stir up your mind uh, tonight and just make you think a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to do something with me. If you would just uh, uh, bow your heads with me for just a moment and let's ask the, the Lord to, to uh, have his way tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we approach that throne because you are sovereign and because you are God and because you are absolute and because you cannot fail and because you can do anything tonight and because we are hungry to receive your word tonight and, and to hear from you tonight and to get something we can hold on to and something we can face the future with because of the turbulence of our times and the injustices of our societies and the crisis in our communities and, and, and the, the hysteria in our homes. We, we need you more today than we have ever needed you before. So Holy Spirit, if you would stop by tonight, not because we are so great, but because God is so good and saturate this place with your grace and glory. I'll be careful to honor you and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. amen. You know, for years we have been teaching you about the promises of God. And we've, we've written songs about it, about being the seed of Abraham. And we've taught series on it and classes on the promises of God. The promises of God, yea and amen. Everywhere your feet trod. God said, I, none of these diseases shall come upon you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And it makes great preaching. I mean, it's a wonderful sermon. You can have tremendous church. But there is another promise of God that we have not talked to you about at all. Jesus promised his disciples, of which we are a part, that offenses shall come. They, 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 they will come. They, they must come. No matter what church you move to. No matter who you remarried. 
no matter what job you take, no matter what community you live in, the one thing is certain in life is that offenses will come. Change your hair, they'll still come. Change the way you dress, they will still come. People will have an issue with you. I don't care what you do. Your, and because of our incessant need, because of our incessant need for validation, there is a spirit of disappointment that engulfs the soul of an individual who is by nature a lover. Now, when I say lover, you think sex. That's not what I'm saying. That might be one expression, but I'm talking about a whole cadre of ideas bigger than that. See, some of us are struggling with the fact that we are by nature a loving people. And when you are a loving person, you have a tendency to expect, need, and want reciprocity. Give it back to me. Give it back to me. We're, we're not, no, 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 no. Let, let's be clear about this thing. We're not having so much trouble with, with our vertical relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we don't have too much trouble with our vertical relationship because, because, because Jesus helped us with that. He shed enough blood that even if we falter in our contract, there, there is a grace clause whereby we can continue in the covenant even though we have not kept up our end of the bargain. So Jesus has fixed it and made it possible that wretches like me and you can stand before God in total righteousness, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. We, we got the vertical part pretty good good. It, it is that horizontal part. And when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, it, 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 what, the challenge was not so much the vertical part, but, but the horizontal part. I, I, I told God one day, I said, Lord, I love you. I absolutely love you. I adore you. I appreciate you. I don't have no problem with you. What you do is all right with me. What you give me, what you don't give me is all right with me. I'm satisfied. I know how to abase. I know how to abound. I've learned whatever state I'm in to be content. I've shouted with money. I've shouted broke. I've shouted when I was in love. I've shouted when I was lonely. I shouted when I had a car. I shouted when I had no car. Lord, I have no problem with you. But it's some of your kids, Jesus. Some of your children, Lord. You and me are cool, but your kids. You ever went to visit somebody and they had bad kids? I told the Lord, I said, I'm going to cut this visit short. It's not you. It's your kids. The things they say and the things they do. Uh, <laughs> Jesus says, offenses do come. Because he's going to use the disciples in a massive way, he warns them and prepares them to get ready for the fact that if you are going to be used in a significant way and do anything significant in your life, just because God blessed you and called you does not mean that, that you can do it without conflict. You, you can be in the will of God and all hell break loose. You can be doing what he called you to do and run into more storms than you have ever seen in your life. Invariably, 
offenses do come. And, and the God who said, let there be light, and the God who turned water into wine, and the God who stopped the funeral procession of the widow at Nain and touched the buyer and raised up the dead boy, and the God who had more healing in the hem of his garment than all of the physicians in America, the God who could do anything but fail, did not promise to take away your trouble. But to use it, as a tool to perfect your character. Amen. Now I understand something that was a dilemma for me for many years. How could Jesus rebuke Peter who loved him enough to cut off ears and Jesus called him Satan and said, get the hints behind me, Satan, and then turn around and look at Judas, who betrayed him and called him friend. Friend, why betrayest thou me with a kiss? And I begin to look back over my life and begin to find out that some of my best friends were my worst enemies. I wouldn't have known how strong I was if they would have stayed with me. I wouldn't have found my strength if they had not betrayed me. I wouldn't have learned my might and my worth had they validated me. I wouldn't have learned the favor of God had people liked me better. But when mother and father and everybody forsook me and I saw God raise me up, it was their rejection that convinced me I must be. I must be, I gotta be God's child. <laughs> My God, I feel the glory of the Lord in this place already. Somebody in this room knows what I'm talking about. Yes, yes, yeah. Before the night is over, you're gonna go home and call all your so-called enemies and say thank you. I appreciate you. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad we went through what we went through. I'm a better woman because of what we went through. I'm a stronger man because of what we went through. <laughs> Somebody who's been through hell and back holler, thank you. So Jesus they asked Jesus a question they said uh, Jesus how many times you, you don't ask how many times if you're not tired? <laughs> How many times do we have to forgive? How many times do we have to turn the other cheek? How? <laughs> How many times do we have to watch other people get blessings that we thought would be ours. How many times do we have to understand? How, how many times do we have to not respond like we could respond? It's not like we don't know how to respond. How many times will you let folks say everything about me and tell me to hold my peace? How many times will I be abused by the very people that I help the most? 
how many times will I invest my love and my attention and my affection and my support in somebody who has no appreciation for the level of my investment inside of them? Hello! Just give me a number so I can know when I'm through, so I can figure out when I'm finished, so I can count them off. There go another one. There goes another one. There goes another one. There goes another one. Hello! So Peter, Peter says to him, uh, <laughs> he says, uh, I, I heard it was seven times. If it were only seven times, I would have been through with this at three months old. For Jesus says to him, you have heard seven times, but I say unto you, 70 times seven. Now to me, even that would have been good news. Because by the time I got to my age now, I would have paid that up. I, I did the math on it. That's not too bad. By now, I know I've been through enough offenses that I would have met my quota. But what Jesus is saying is that no matter what life throws on you, throw it off. Every time it hits you, throw it off. Every time you face it, throw it off. Every time you run up against it, throw it off. Every time they lie on you, throw it off. Every time you're offended, throw it off. And, and, and what was ironic to me, can we just talk about it? I just want to talk for a minute like we at Starbucks. You know, just you and me hanging out at Starbucks talking about, what's up, man? How you doing? What, what's really going on with you? Because most people who ask you how you are don't wait for no real answer. <laughs> to all of you who just came to this country and you're learning English, when we say, how are you, we don't want an answer. It's a greeting. <laughs> it means hello. Because most people don't wait to hear how you are. The disciples... When they heard that Jesus was trying to put a system in place of perpetual release, a system in place that no matter what hits you, it falls off you like water off a duck's back. A system in place that would cause you not to hold on to the injuries of yesterday. A system in place that would cause you to resist the temptation to become contaminated in your personality to the degree that you lose the essence of what God chose you for in the first place. No, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. When they heard it, they said, these, these people whose shadows would fall on people and they would be healed, these these people who would lay hands on people and raise them from the dead. When they heard how many times they would have to live with offenses, they said, increase our faith. So I ask God, what does faith have to do with forgiveness? And if faith is what gives me the ability to cast off offense, then I have not been taught that. I have been taught to have faith for salvation, faith for circumstances. I have not been taught to use my faith on how I feel. And in the absence of this information, I've collected a lot of clothes. I got three different sizes. <laughs> Sometime I'm on this end of the rack. 
and sometime I'm on that end of the rack. I've had a lot of experiences through my faith, but I have found out it doesn't matter what you wear, what you drive, how many degrees you have, you can be all fixed up on the outside, but if you're miserable on the inside, it means absolutely nothing at all. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I've, I've been with people who had more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> Professional students, lifelong careers of learning, spouting concepts and ideologies that were before their time, and still they were not happy. I have been with the rich, the fabulous, and the famous, and seen them by beds they couldn't sleep in. And I concluded like Solomon, it's all vanity. I've seen beautiful people, I mean, just, just, just drop dead gorgeous people. I mean, past gorgeous, gorgeous. And crazy as a cockroach in a liquor bottle. Somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. I mean, I've seen some cute folks so crazy, I was happy to take my ugly self back home. I said, I'm ugly, but at least I ain't crazy. taking more medicine than we have ever taken in the history of this country. We have more emotional disorders now than we did through Jim Crow, through slavery. We were raped and castrated and murdered and didn't have the anxiety we got right now. We got to take pills to go to sleep. We got to take pills to get up in the morning. We got to take pills to be in a good mood. Some of you got happy pills in your pocketbook right now. Your grandmama didn't need happy pills and she didn't have no gas and no lights and she was cooking her chicken on a cold stove and yet you can't find a way to smile without stopping by a drugstore filled up with the Holy Ghost there's gotta be something wrong with this our old women used to be the glue that held the family together when nobody else could deal with the drama in the family, Big Mama would come in the house and say, what's going on in here? And shut the whole thing down. But today, Big Mama can't remember her name, doesn't recognize her children. She's stuck up in a nursing home with a mouthful of food she can't swallow, dying of Alzheimer's. We are stressed out. We are nervous. We are fatigued. Something is wrong. We are... We are not designed to carry the load we carry. We're, we're not built for it. We got folks 30 years old and tired. How are you tired at 30? 
I was dancing like Michael Jackson at 30. I don't mean tired at night. We got folks who wake up as tired as they were when they went to bed. They got sleep, but they didn't get rest. They were tossing and turning and murmuring and arguing and fighting all in your sleep. You wake up in the morning, you can't believe the alarm clock. You choke it and call it a liar. Call out of bed. Drag yourself to the job you prayed that God would give you. And you're driving there saying, oh God, if you don't help me today, I'm going to clock up in this. Is it just me? Touch your neighbor and say something is wrong. The Lord sent me. The Lord sent me around the country to take you you're carrying more than you're supposed to be carrying everybody brings you everything you got your drama you got their drama you got the kids drama you got your cousin's drama you got the drama at church and the drama at work and the drama with the grandkids. Some of your grandmamas raising kids for the third time. We're carrying too much. We're, we're not falling into sin because we're wretches. We're falling into sin to anesthetize the turbulence on the inside, trying to find some way to appease the pains of life because we are carrying too much. We have loved and lost so many times that we have stopped loving. We say it, we say it, but check me on this. The older you get, the harder it is to fall in love. Your faller breaks. When you feel yourself leaning, you catch yourself. You say, wait. The, the, the last time I invested in somebody like that, I like to lost my mind. If you're going to fall in love, you better do it before about 23 or so. After about, about, about round 25, your fall completely breaks short circuits and starts sparking like spark plugs. We are actors in our own lives, saying lines we used to mean, playing roles we used to feel, sitting at the dinner table, going through the traditions of our families without the passion that we used to have. Oh, it got quiet in here tonight. It's quiet because <laughs> you know I'm telling the truth. You absolutely know I'm telling the truth. We, we were not designed to carry such pain, such anger. I look at people with little kids and, and I, I pat them and go on snickering to myself saying, baby, if you had any idea what little boo-boo was going to take you through,
while you snapping boo-boo down in that car seat, you have no idea that about 15 years from now, boo-boo going to steal the car. You're not going to know where the car is, and you're going to be standing in the driveway saying, if I can get my hands on boo-boo, I'm a drunk. I stood in the driveway one night, the Holy Ghost told me to go in the house. I forsook my wife. I said, you wait on them. Because I, I can't do it. I can't, I can't, I can't. I don't know what the... Look at this. I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching that we should become these nice Pollyanna type people who, who, just, who just melt into the abyss of mush. No, 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 no. I, I spend two chapters talking about how important it is that you have the gift of anger. Anger is good. You need anger. Jesus got angry. You, you need righteous indignation. Anger stimulates your, your adrenaline glands so you can fight or flight. It's a chemistry that God put in your body. Anger helps people to understand parameters and sends out warning signals that you've gone too far. If you keep on down the road you're going on, I can't be responsible for what you do. You need anger. It's good to be angry. You can be as angry as you want to be till 559. The Bible said not to let the sun go down on your wrath. You were commanded, be angry. He said, it's no sin to be angry. The problem is when you stay angry, when you lay down on it and you get up with it and you drive to work with it and you keep reliving it and rehashing it and going over and over, complete with pictures and sound. Some of you got stereo sound of something that happened five years ago and you don't understand that your anger has got you you tied to your history and it's doing it at the expense of your destiny but the Lord sent me here tonight to cut you loose from where you came from because God wants to work a miracle in your life touch fire people whether you know them or not and just say let it go let it go let it go let it go get rid of it get it out of you release it turn it and loose get it out of your spirit and out of your mind and out of your heart stop laying down on it and getting up with it and turning around with it crying yourself to sleep just let it go preach it and we got to teach it because most of our folk, we, we don't go to the psychologist, we don't go to the psychiatrist, we don't lay on the couch, we just keep drinking in more and more trauma, 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 and we try to dance it out and we spin around and holler Jesus three times and we hopped on one foot and we fell out and we got slain in the floor but when we got up, Jesus says, I want you to develop a system of letting it go. Watch what I'm saying to you. Our God is a circle, never a line. Ezekiel says he's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. 
The reason he is expressed as a circle and not a line is because a line has a beginning and an end. But a circle is everlasting, eternal, without beginning or end of days. He is a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And because he is a circle, when he spoke, he spoke circles. And, and the earth was circular. And it began to move in a circle. And the sun it moved around was in a circle. And everything God spoke was in a circle, which is a cycle. And the cycles and the circles spinning determine the seasons in your life. And all of it moves by a rhythm. And the reason that gravity holds us down is because earth has a rhythm. If you lose the rhythm, you've lost the power. And, and what, what unforgiveness does, it, it, it breaks your rhythm. Abbreviates your destiny. Shuts down what you were created to do. Distracts you from the focus of being your highest and best self. And all of it for somebody who's not even in your space anymore. Somebody throw your hands up and say, I lost my rhythm. You, you, you create through a rhythm. That's why a woman has a cycle. You create through a rhythm. Your heart beats at a rhythm. If the rhythm changes, the doctor gets concerned because it is the rhythm that causes the blood to run up and down the highways of your cardiovascular system, all moving at a rhythm. If any kind of impediment gets in the veins or the artery, it blocks the rhythm. And if it blocks the rhythm, you can have a heart attack because you lost your rhythm. You breathe with the rhythm. Even when you sleep, you got a rhythm. You can walk in a room and hear a loved one breathing and say, oh, mama, sleep, because you hear the rhythm of the breathing with Without being conscious, you take in what you can use. You exhale what you can't use. You take in what you can use. You exhale what you can't use. You take in what you can use. You exhale what you can't use. You take in what you can use. You exhale what you can't use. If you ever take in and stop exhaling, you will die. If your heart ever loses its rhythm, you will die. If your blood ever clots, you will die. And yet, the problem in your life is that you have taken in something that you have not let go of. And any time you lose your rhythm, you lose your passion, you lose your creativity, you lose your strength. My God, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but slap somebody and tell them, I got to get my rhythm back. I got to get my rhythm. I got to get my... Lord, this man done messed up my rhythm. Lord, this child done messed up my rhythm. Lord, this job done messed up my rhythm. Take in, take in a breath. Take in a breath. And try not to let it go. <laughs> and yet, you have turned your living soul into a graveyard of experiences where you've taken in so many dead things. that you have not let go. So many memories that you have not let go. Disappointments that you have not let go. Unforgiveness is not a problem amongst evil people.
because evil people don't care what you do. Unforgiveness has a propensity to attach itself to people who have the capacity to be great lovers, great givers, great thinkers, great supporters, great participators. Unforgiveness is a symptom of a loving soul turned sour. So the disciples said, increase our faith. Why increase our faith? What, 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 what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. In other words, I could let go of my history if I had hope in my destiny that the thing in front of me is greater than the thing behind me. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. But my problem is the devil is trying to tell me that my best days are behind me. And when I look behind me and I realize everything that happened to me, I need faith to believe that before I die, all the hell I've been through is going to make some sense. I need faith. I need, I don't mind weeping, enduring for a night. I don't mind that as long as I know that joy is coming in the morning. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. Oh, am I preaching right in here tonight? Am I talking to anybody in here tonight? Slap your neighbor and tell him your joy is in front of you. Your joy is in front of you. Your, your joy is in front of you. Your reconciliation is in front of you. Your creativity is in front of you. God wants to restore unto you the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust ate up. God wants to give you double for your trouble. You're going to end up saying it was good for me that I was afflicted. I'm glad you didn't stay. I'm glad you ran off with another woman. I'm glad I went through what I'm, oh, can I be real in here? at your neighbor and say, you got to shake yourself loose. You've been in a coma of apathy. You've been paralyzed by indifference. You've been shut down by circumstance. You still smile, but you ain't happy. You still grin, but you don't have joy. You still write nice notes, but you've lost your love. But I challenge you to get your first love back and God will open up the windows of heaven and Unforgiveness 
in the absence of healing. It's like developing a scab to cover a wound while it heals. But the problem is you still got the scab. You still got the scab. Can I go a little bit deeper with this? I promise you, I have not lost my preacher, but I, I just, I just want to dig down in here just, just a little bit deeper. I was, I was trying to figure because, because see, unforgiveness is a useless product. It's not like you hurt who hurt you by not forgiving them. Because most and generally, they don't care. It's not like you protect yourself from being hurt by unforgiveness because your hurt is unforgiveness. For you not to forgive as a way of punishing the perpetrator is as foolish as drinking poison and waiting on your enemy to die. You're the one that can't sleep anymore. You're the one that's lost your joy and peace. You're the one who stopped being creative and just started existing. You're the one that's going through the motions in your life. You're the one who's still tied to the umbilical cord of rehearsing the same incidents over and over again, strengthening your low self-esteem, your fear, your intimidation, and your insecurities. You are drinking the poison that's making you sick it's not your enemy it's not the devil it's not a witch it's not a demon this is a self-induced affliction you could be happy if you would change what you think about if you could Resist the propensity to rehearse the past. And it's all in your conversation. Anybody who will hang around long enough, eventually it will come out of your mouth because it is trapped in your heart. One of the other things I dealt with, the, the Bible says none but the pure in heart shall see God. The word pure in its original language, me, it's the same word where we get catheter for, from. A catheter, to, to drain impurities away. He says, in order for your heart to be pure, you have to perpetually keep draining off the toxic things that happen to you. Because if you don't keep draining it off, you will lose your vision because of the contamination that you have in your heart and you're making the devil's job easy. Why should he curse you when you are cursing your Why should he kill your ministry? If your pain has taken away your creativity, if you're bitter over who left your church, and every time you see them, they change your mood, then the enemy doesn't have to attack your message because misery will come up out of your mouth because you won't let it go. And the person you feel it against is shouting and dancing and rejoicing as if they never knew you, as if you never paid the rent, as if you didn't go see them in the hospital and there you are. Have lost your unction.
because you will not let it go. I'm going to go a little bit deeper. I was, I was in South Africa and I, I was invited to South Africa to speak. And one of the times I was in South Africa, I was invited to South Africa by a group of billionaires. Some of the first black billionaires had formed a team and they invited me over there to speak to the billionaires about business and faith and how you merge the two of them together. And the person who put on the event was the first black billionaire after the apartheid. And as a benefit of flying 21 hours through four different time zones, he, he said, I, I want you to go on a safari. And I told my wife, I said, he's sending us on a safari. Uh, she was not excited, but that's a whole nother thing. So, so I, I admit, I, I did lose some enthusiasm when they put us on this little prop plane and we landed in the middle of the jungle on a little strip where there was no lights or nothing. Uh, some of the adventure in me did dissipate a little bit. But uh, so, so we're on this safari with all of these elephants and, and lions and rhinoceros and stuff. We being my, me and my youngest son, uh, Sarita was at the house. Uh, and, and we stayed out till late at night and it got dark. And, and we had seen everything from rattlesnakes to eagles. And, and, it, and I was good. I was good. I had my faith. Till it got dark. When it got dark, some of the anointing began to, to, to recede a little bit. Now, now I'm out there uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a professor from a university who is explaining to me the purpose of every animal and its teeth and its paws and its strength and its care. He's going through all of this and how the, the teeth of the animals are designed to sever the branch in such a way that the branch can still grow again. And he's giving me all of this scientific data. He's giving me intellect. But I also have a Zulu guide who has instincts. So the Zulu is sitting on the front of the Jeep. And while the man is giving me all of this information, the Zulu is going, the elephant is that way. And, and so I'm having a lovely time. I mean, just an absolutely marvelous time. Yes, it was a marvelous time. Absolutely a marvelous time until it got dark. When it got dark, I got nervous. So the professor said to me, he said, oh, do not worry, Bishop. He said, everything will be well. I said, how do you know that? He said, the animals eat in the morning. I said, I hope to God they got a watch. And, and, and then he says to me, check this out. He says, animals are not like humans. He said, they only eat with purpose. They do not attack out of emotion. If you don't violate their turf and they are not hungry, they will not eat you. And suddenly I realized you don't see like uh, a cheetah looking at another cheetah talking about she thinks she's cute. You, you, you don't see animals having emotional altercations. Animals are not unforgiving. So I found out it was not natural in the animal kingdom for animals to be unforgiving. And then I took it to the next level. Children are not unforgiving. We did not come here being unforgiving. You can chastise a child. And 30 minutes later, she hugging your leg, talking about, oh, Papa, oh, Papa, oh, Papa, we going to the store, pick me up, Papa, oh, Mama, you so pretty. <laughs> Kids.
kids can get into a squirm and skirmish. And if the adults get in it, the adults will be mad for three years. The kids will want to go outside and play, and the grown folks will still be angry. Watch what I'm saying to you. Unforgiveness is a learned behavior. I'm going to go a little bit deeper. Because since I opened that up, I want to go into where you got it from. I, and I know I can't give you everything. That's why I wrote the book so you can, because this, this is a big issue. Watch this. What we are talking about is conflict resolution. How do you resolve conflict? When you came here, you let it go every time it happened. Every time it happened, you wanted to go play again. You wanted to go love again. You wanted to go hug again. You wanted to smile again. What happened to you that you lost your love again, play again, smile again, personality? And are you not engaging in relationships in the hopes that somebody will give you back what you lost? Watch this. You didn't take it in school, unforgiveness. There were no unforgiveness classes. There are not a set of tapes to learn unforgiveness. Where did you learn this from? Think back to how you grew up. You learn how to laugh like your family laughs. My family is crazy. When we get together, we laugh like we're going to die. <laughs> You about killed me. <laughs> My wife's family is real quiet. They go like. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same feeling, but how we express the feeling is a result of the environment we respond in. Your anger and how you deal with frustration whether your daddy wouldn't talk. What's wrong with you? Nothing. <laughs> or whether your mama talked too much. No, we need to talk about it. Now come back to the doctor. <laughs> and you with your loving little self was watching. And you learn to hold a grudge. And you learn to be phony. You learn to smile and hang up the phone and say, I can't stand her. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you... can, can I go into this now? Now you got 30, 40 years of a collection of stuff. And you're wondering why all that spinning around and jerking and falling in the floor and dance has not brought the promises of God in your life. You've lost your rhythm. You've lost your passion. You've lost your joy. Oh, we can get it going with the drum, and if they sing good enough, look at how much money we have to spend to bring you joy. Look at all this equipment we got. Praise dancers, praise singers, electronic equipment. Your grandmama got happy with a washboard. I'm going to tell you two more things. I'm going to let you go. Look, look, let me tell you something. God has really, really blessed me. And, and, I, and, and I, I don't have to do a lot of things. I do. I want to do them. I want to be engaged with my people and my community. And I want to be able to touch people on a grassroots level. I choose to do that. I, I want to do that. I shot my movie in New Orleans because I knew there were people in New Orleans who needed a job. We shot Sparkle in Detroit. We knew there were people in Detroit who needed I choose to do that. Through some amazing grace, I've been blessed to sit at the table with, with the last three presidents, the last three of them, with, with nine heads of state around the world, with the top CEOs in the country. I've done business with the best and the brightest. And, 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 and 
being a little country boy from the hills of West Virginia, I wasn't used to that. So when I came into an environment where they were doing business, they'll, let me tell you how it works. They'll be sitting around a table and they'll start debating stuff and the debate gets hot and it gets hostile and people start slamming stuff and throwing proposals and slashing papers and saying, no, we got to have 25% off or we're not doing the deal. And I thought, no, we're not doing it. And then they'll look at the watch and say, Jim, it's about 12 o'clock. You want to go to lunch? <laughs> and I thought, you going to lunch? How can you argue like that? And I found out something. When you think like an eagle, you can attack an issue without attacking the individual. <laughs> and when everything is said and done, Eagles let things go. That's why chickens can't hang out with eagles. Because the problem with chicken thinking people is that chickens. I know I'm gonna mess with you. I like chicken too, but let me tell you something. Chickens are the nastiest creatures you ever saw in your life. Chickens don't just eat corn. They eat branches, sticks, rocks. Chicken eat feces. They eat what they should have gotten rid of. They eat it again and then lose it and eat it again and then lose it and eat it again. And that's why chickens can't fly. They get fat and they flap and they make a lot of noise and they got a lot of feathers, but they can't fly over five feet in the air because chickens have been eating stuff they should have let go. But let me tell you about eagles. Eagles never eat off the ground. Eagles fly through the air. They eat their food in the mountain tops and in the high places. And I'm wondering tonight, are there any eagles in here? If you are an eagle, why are you eating what you should have gotten rid of? Eagles eat their food in the tops of the mountains. Eagles spread their wings nine feet long and use the storm to escalate them into another dimension. Eagles eat so high in the air that they have moved themselves away from their prey. They can see for miles through the dark in a storm because their eyes are keen because they don't keep eating the stuff that's on the ground. And eagles make love in the air. 10,000 and 20,000 feet in the air, they lock themselves into an embrace and as they spiral down, they make love in the air. This they do so that nature has fixed it, that eagles could never make love to chickens because chickens are too low to operate on that level. And what I'm trying to tell you tonight is all you got to do is decide what whether you're going to think like a chicken or fly like an egg. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm getting ready to spread my wings. This is my season to spread my wings. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Shout yes! Shout yes! Shout yes! So what I'm, what I'm, stand to your feet, what I'm trying to tell you tonight. I know, 
I know a lot of us don't read, but not that we can't read, we just don't read. But if you don't read, you can't lead. I spent a year researching how to use your faith to heal your heart. To get the courage Just let it go so that the enemy does not abuse you twice. First in reality and second in the repetition of the things you will not let go. Forgiveness does not exonerate the perpetrator. It does not mean that they were right. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. There are people in this room that need to forgive somebody who's moved. And some, somebody who's dead. If, if you wait for things to be made right, what do you do if they're dead? If, if you wait on them to pay you the money back, some people ain't going to never pay you back. <laughs> You're just going to have to let it go. So that you can fly like an eagle. People are not worth it. What they did is not worth it. Why would you eat it again? And again. And again. If you're not a reader, you don't do nothing but sit on put it in the bathroom and read five pages an occasion. We got to get well because we're getting sick. We're dying too soon. We're eating too much or too little, overeating or starving ourselves to death, trying to find some way to live with all the disappointment and the hell we've been through. And all you have to do is let it go. We don't tell each other the sick stuff we eat because it's so personal and so painful. We smile for each other to keep anybody from knowing what we have been through. Other people, the moment something happened to them, they all up laid out on the couch talking about when I was two. Uh, we just shake it down and keep on getting up. But we are dying too soon. My challenge to you, without waiting on them to make it right, because that's too much power to give somebody who don't like me. <laughs> J 
join hands with somebody. Span the aisle. Squeeze that hand. Is, is that a chicken or an eagle? <laughs> this, is, this is what I think. I think we've got some eagles who have been stuck in chicken coops. Can you imagine the frustration of something that was created to fly miles in the air and they're stuck in a dead, mundane, ritualistic, monotonous chicken coop? The Lord told me if I would stop and arrest my schedule and, and travel again and, and just teach this around the country, that somebody would hear it and be healed and be released and be set free. In the last few days, I've done the Dr. Phil show. I've done the Oprah show. Oprah's brought me back to do her life classes. I've been on Soledad O'Brien. I've been on CNN, been on Fox, been everywhere. In three days, the book went to the New York Times bestsellers list. I didn't come to sell you a book. The books are in Walmarts and Kmarts and Target. And all. I don't have to come to church to sell a book. I came to stir your mind. With the possibility that your life could be brighter. I have never had a book go to the times list in three days. I have never seen people have been uh, hitting me up on Twitter, at Bishop Jakes. They've been hitting me up over and over again saying, I called my sister I haven't spoken to for three years. I called my ex-husband and said, we will always have the children in common. We got to learn how to talk to each other. We got to get our families back. I know they crazy. I got crazy folks in my family too. But they my family. The yoke I'm coming against tonight is the most difficult yoke to come against. It is a yoke in the wounded heart of somebody who has become callous and stubborn. They're not bad people. Bad people wouldn't even be here tonight. They are eagles stuck in a coop. And all the dancing and all the shouting hadn't set you free. But I declare to you tonight that ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Squeeze that hand. God wants to liberate the person you're touching right now. No, no more shata da da da. Fiko shata banda de keto toto chata. He no more shata. God wants to liberate that soul right now. He wants to set that woman free. He wants to set that man free. He, he, he wants to deliver them, bring that hypertension down. He wants to take that stress off of them. He wants to give them a victory right now, tonight, in the name of Jesus. The anointing of God is moving through this room tonight. It's moving through this room. Touching mamas and daughters and sisters and brothers and old men and young men. God wants your passion back, your joy back, your life back. He said, I came so you could have life. I'm not trying to take your life away. I came to give you life. Squeeze.
knees and hands. The anointing is flowing. The anointing. The anointing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 Yokes are breaking. Strongholds are breaking. Get your love back. Get your passion back. Get your creativity back. Start writing again and singing again and living again and moving again and traveling again. You got to let your latter days be your best day. Squeeze that hand. There's life in that hand. There's anointing in that hand. There's power in that hand. There's another woman in you. There's another man in you. Lord, let your glory fill this place. <laughs> the sister behind you just got a breakthrough. The brother on the right just got a breakthrough. Hallelujah to God. That woman in front of you just got a breakthrough. Don't you let this moment pass you by. Don't you fly out of here and go back to that chicken coop. Don't you flutter your feathers and go back and live in hell. The devil is a lie. I rebuke every bondage. I break every yoke. I tear down every barrier. You will not go back to that chicken coop tonight. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, you're touching a miracle right now. You're touching a miracle right now. Anybody else would have lost their mind. Anybody else would have committed suicide. Anybody else would have thrown in the towel. Hallelujah, you're touching a survivor. That man is a survivor. That woman is a survivor. Open your mouth and praise God. The glory of the Lord. Yes, your life is not over. Your vision is not over. Get your stuff back. Hallelujah. Faith is the substance of what you hope for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody help me praise him. Somebody help me check. and say, I got to get it back, 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 I feel a breakthrough, I feel a breakthrough, I feel a breakthrough, tonight's my night, tonight's my night, tonight's my night. I dare you to praise him tonight.
want you while you got the anointing on you. While you got the spirit of God on you. I want you to touch somebody and just speak blessings all over their life. Speak healings. Speak to their children. Speak to their finances. Speak to their heart. Speak to their emotions. Declare a blessing. Speak it right out loud. Declare it right out of your mouth. You shall have whatever you say. You shall have. I'm gonna sit with me for just one second. One more thing I want to tell you, and I promise I'm gonna let you go. I ain't been here for six years, so give me six minutes. I don't know whether you can feel what I feel in this place or not, but I feel a gully washing release in here. I feel a deluge and a downpouring of release down in the deepest part of your belly. Somebody's going to start writing books and somebody's going to start speaking poetry and somebody's going to get their anointing back and somebody, yes, 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 Lord.
60 seconds. Let everything that has breath praise ye the There is a sense of freedom in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, no more chicken coops for me. Yeah. Sit with me just a second. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to holler like that. But when I think of his goodness, sometimes I can't help it. God knows how to speak to me like nobody knows how to speak to me. Can, can I get a witness in here? I'm going to give you a little faith exercise. In our church, I made a commitment to my church that I wouldn't go on the road and teach this till I taught it at home. And uh, we did something, I can't do it tonight, but we did it there. We took these balloons, 8,000 of them, filled them with helium. I had them all go outside and write on the balloons something they were going to let go. People cried. They danced. They worshiped. Mary just got healed. People got restored because they decided to let it go. Oh, to all the environmentalists, they were the kind of balloons that did not affect the environment, so don't tweet me tonight. I get everything. I want you to do something. It's, it's silly, but indulge me. Get an envelope, an offering envelope, if you will, and, and I want you to get a pen. I don't want you to tell your business, but I want you to write something on the envelope that you're going to let go. An anger, a temper, a Fred, Willie May. <laughs> nook, nook. <laughs> nook, nook. 
something that you think has limited you in some way from being who you were meant to be. Ain't nobody going to know what it means but you and God. But I want you to write it down, make it plain, that we're going to take action on this word tonight. And we're going to let it go. And when you write it, I want you to be praying that this is not just something you did, but it is in fact something you mean, that tonight you're going to simply let it go. I want everybody to really use tonight as an opportunity to get your rhythm back. Maybe your problem is that you have not forgiven you. You may need to write your name on it. Maybe your problem is that you need to get the book for somebody who won't let go of the grudge they have against you. Don't argue with them. Just send them the book. Say, I bought you a gift. Let it go. And just like the old saints would bring their sacrifice to the altar, I want everybody that can, and I know there are people that cannot see in that envelope. And I want you to make a commitment and a covenant with God tonight. That this is more than another church service. But tonight is a night that we make a commitment, we're going to let it go. If you need to write a check, make it out to deliverance. Not to me. And as soon as you get ready, I, I bought helium balloons for my members. I can't buy helium all over the country. <laughs> I can't do it, baby. You're going to have to imagine it floating in the air. You're going to have to just see it in the spirit going up. <laughs> Ain't that much helium in the world. <laughs> but I want you, as, as, as the saints would bring a lamb to the altar, I want you to bring that thing down to the altar and lay it on the altar as a symbol of your commitment to heed the word and let it go. Ain't nobody's business what you bring into the altar. But I want you to put that seed in it and lay that thing on the altar. I'm not going to usher you. You may be the only person on your row. You can't wait on nobody. Tonight I want you to sow that seed. And I want it to be symbolic of the thing in your life that you are going to let it go tonight. And I know you're in the balcony. And I know it's a walk, but I declare it's worth it. Get up, step past people who are satisfied where they are. And you come and you lay it on the altar between you and God. That means you're not going to fuss about it. You're not going to rant about it. You're not going to dream about it. You're not going to keep bringing it up. you getting out of that chicken coop tonight. Come on, somebody. And tonight I make a commitment, I'm going to let it go. It might be a habit. It might be a nasty mouth, a nasty temper. It might be something your sister did, something your member did, something your pastor did, a daddy that didn't raise you, a mama that didn't love you, somebody who gave you up. But tonight, I'm too old to hold on to this pain. Tonight, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it go tonight. I'm through being sick about it. I'm through being worried about it. I'm through being frustrated about it. Tonight, I'm going to let it go. Get your best gift in there, whatever it is. If it's $22 and a coupon to KFC. I want you to participate. I want your family to be represented. I want your heart and your emotions and your spirit and your soul to make a commitment. I didn't just hear the word. I'm going to act on this word tonight and tonight by faith. 
I'm going to let it go. Father, I pray that you give miracles in the aisle. Father, I pray that you give deliverance on the steps. Give God a praise. You might not can do what somebody else can do, but everything that got breath can give God a praise tonight. Hundreds of you are coming tonight. Come praying. Come making a covenant. Don't just come because you can or because you could. Come with a conviction tonight. I'm going to settle it tonight. Touch somebody and say, I'm going to settle it tonight. Tonight is my night for amazing miracles for tremendous breakthrough. Tonight is my night. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to help them praise the Lord. I heard somebody holler, I'm free. Clap your hands and give God a praise. coming. I'm coming tonight. Hallelujah. On my level, I'm going to sow tonight. On my level, I'm going to sow tonight. On my level, I'm going to sow tonight. Tonight's my night to let it go. Anybody get a blessing tonight? Anybody glad you came to church tonight? If the Lord spoke to your heart tonight, would you find some kind of way to give him praise tonight? Many of you are still coming. <laughs> I want the deacons to get something ready to gather this seed with a pot, a pail, a gunny sack. I don't know what gunny sacks are, but that sounded good, so I thought I'd say it. If you're grateful for deliverance opening up their doors tonight, would you thank God once more for this great church and this great pastor? <laughs> Glory to God. Anybody else coming, come right now. Sometimes you have to move when the anointing is moving. You can't wait and meet me in the parking lot and talk about the Lord convicted me, brother. I just can't go home. I just, I just got to find you. Because you have to flow with people when the anointing is on them. When the anointing is not on them, they just people like anybody else. Talk to me, somebody. As the deacons receive the offering of the Lord, would you clap your hands and thank God tonight? I've been traveling around the country and, and signing books during the day and signing at night, and I got ahead of the game now. I'm, I've already left several hundred copies signed in the lobby. And uh, as long as they last, you're welcome to them to, to give, to read, to study. My purpose in speaking is to tell you why you ought to do it. My purpose in writing is to guide you into how you can let it go in a very practical, pragmatic way. 
and live free and not let people or things or circumstances drive you crazy. Somebody exhale for me just. <laughs> That's what one of the Greek words for forgive means, to get it out of you. How many feel like you got it out of you tonight? Still coming. I know that's a long walk. Some of y'all ain't walked that far since you was on the high school track team. That's the only thing about these big churches. When we was in them storefronts, we run all over the church. Now we run halfway and turn around and come back. Anybody else want their seed counted? Want to sow before we pray? Bring it this way, deacons. Bring it all this way. Here's another lady coming. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? Bless you. People coming out of the back. Glory to God. Bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Pastor, thank you for taking the risk. You know, when the church does something like this, they got to hire police officers, direct traffic, make sure your car's out there when you go back. The musicians got to work extra nights. Everybody got to come out. The office is up. It's a lot of drama that you would not believe. Phone ringing off the hook. Crazy people saying all kinds of crazy stuff and doing stuff that you wouldn't believe happens behind the scenes. Thank you for being a man of faith who would go that extra mile. And I believe in God that every need will be met and every expense will be met and, and that the church will suffer no loss in opening up its doors. We, we need this kind of ministry. Amen. And we don't need it way across somewhere we can't get to. We need it where we can get to it. Come on, talk to me, somebody. It's getting where some of the greatest ministries go into place we can't even get to. We need it. We need it right in our cities and right in our neighborhoods and right in the middle of the drama. Jesus went right in the middle of the drama and started preaching the infallible word of God. Father, I consecrate these seeds tonight. It's, it's more than the seed that's sown. It's what it represents. I do not minimize nor trivialize the things they wrote tonight. Some of the things that are written on this envelope cause people a lot of pain. Years of questions about themselves, doubts and uncertainties, abuses and insecurities, raising kids alone, hurt in places that they can't even talk about. I understand that. I know this is no small thing. We make a commitment tonight that tonight starts the process of a tremendous release. And I pray for every seed and every soul and every family that they would escape the chicken coops of life. And that in this season of their life, whether they are seven or 70, it makes no difference, that they would spread their wings take to the wind to take to the wind and fly again and live again and love again and feel again in Jesus name Amen
Give him the best praise you got, would you? Now, wait, I, I, I know you, I know you got to be the first person out the parking lot, but just hold up just a minute. Because if you think about it a minute, we, we sit at home and we sit at work and then we rush to the car so we can sit in the car so we can go home and sit down. So, so you know, just, just take, I know this is not a revival or nothing like that, and I'm on a book tour, but I'm still a preacher. I, w- I want to take a minute and ask, is there anybody in here that does not know Jesus? If, if, if This is not a revival, but, but I declare, I'd hate for you to get all of this teaching and not get the substratum of what we came to say. He's the liberator of your soul. He's the lifter of your head. He's the mind regulator and a heart fixer. I didn't come to Jesus to be a preacher. I came to Jesus because my life was all messed up. My head was crazy. I was freaked out, about to lose my mind. I needed some help before I did something stupid to myself. I came to Jesus because things were out of whack and out of place. And and, and the, 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 the tunnels that I dug in the word to find healing for myself became cisterns of living water that I preached to around the world. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not just an owner. I'm a client. I'm a patient. I, I take my my treatments. I use my medication. Jesus is the reason that I'm breathing and living and moving and functioning and to God be the glory for the things he's done. And I'm telling you, I don't care what you own. I don't care what you did. I don't care who you did it with. Jesus died for your freedom to liberate you and set you free. You have not gone so far that God will not catch you. You've not fallen so low that he cannot reach you. Tonight, if you want Jesus, backslider, whoremonger, hypocrite, backbiter, I don't care what you are, you can come to Jesus and find everlasting life. And before I leave this rostrum, I want to give you an opportunity tonight, if you don't know Jesus, Jesus to bring yourself down this aisle and let us minister to you that you might come to know the Lord. Is there one tonight? 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 He's an emancipator. He's a liberator. He is the seed of Abraham. He's a meek and humble lamb. He is the root of Jesse. He's the bright and morning star. He's the lily in your valley. Is there one tonight? Is there one tonight? Ain't God all right? Ain't he a way maker? Isn't he a bridge over troubled waters? Isn't he a heart fixer? Won't he do it for you? Won't he straighten it out? Won't he put you back together again? You might feel like you humpty dumpty. You fell off the wall. Let me tell you, all the king's men can't put you together again, but the king can. The king can put your life back together again. I wish I had a witness, somebody that Jesus gave you a hookup and turned you around and straightened you out. Clap your hands and help me praise the Lord tonight. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. I've seen God take homeless people and make them homeowners. I've seen it. I've seen it. We have a program for ex-inmates in Dallas, our Texas Offenders Reentry Initiative. 7,000 inmates have gone through our programs, got jobs, got back with their family, reduced the rate of recidivism. God can do it. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've been into. We do street meetings, going after prostitutes and drug dealers and ministering to people on the street, in the alley, in the gutter. I am through waiting on people to come to church. I'm going to go out and snatch me somebody. I'm going to snatch me somebody. for G- I'm going to snatch them. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what country they came from. I don't care if they got their shoes on backwards. I'm going to win somebody for Jesus in the name of the Lord. Somebody clap your hands. We got to get our children back. Go get your son. Go get your daughter. Go get your brother, your sister. Get them back. I'm, I'm, I'm not a Philadelphian. I do eat the cheesesteaks and stuff, but I'm not a Philadelphian. Pastor Spaulding is coming in a minute because 
I don't live here. I live in Dallas. But the Lord sent me here as an instrument to minister to you tonight, to get things started. And I believe tonight that, that Christ's blood is all it takes to wash your every sin away. I ain't no goody two-shoe person. I ain't gonna tell you all my business, but I done some stuff <laughs> more than once. And I'm a living witness. God loves you. He really does love you. He really does love you. And he knows stuff about you that you would never tell nobody. You wouldn't admit to your mama and them. He still loves you. And he kept you alive when you was acting crazy. It's time now, man. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. I don't want to go see you in prison. It's time. This is time. Let's do this thing. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, in the name of Jesus, we have ministered, we have shared, we've taught, we've sang, we've prayed, and you've brought these souls to this altar. I don't know these people by name, but you know every one of them. You know everything they've been through. I want to thank you first that they're not dead. I want to thank you that somehow they escaped the traps of the enemy well enough to be here tonight. And then I want to ask you, Lord, since you spared their life and gave them a chance and they took it tonight to come into their heart and set them free. Father, I ask you to fill them with your spirit and let your peace abide. Wash away every sin in Jesus' name. Say this with me, Father. I believe that you sent your son. His name was Jesus. He died on the cross for my sins. I accept his blood for my redemption. And Lord, I give my life over to you. I thank you. I could have been dead, but you let me live so I could let it go. Give God a praise right now. I love you too. Pastor wants me to pray for he and his wife and pray a blessing over this church. Personal workers, come on and take care. Personal workers, if you come and minister to my brothers and sisters, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I see some new deacons and some sopranos and altos and some ushers and stuff. I do. I see it. Somebody thank God for these brothers and sisters. The work of the ministry is difficult. Being a minister is not easy. It's hard on you. It's hard on your marriage. It's hard on your body. It's hard on your mind. You, you make it look like it's easy. But I know the real deal. You pay a lot to do what you do. And I want to take this opportunity. While so many people love you for what you do, I don't want to minister to what you do without ministering to who you are. Sometimes what you do succeeds while who you are suffers. And tonight I want to pray for you and for your husband and for your family and for all of those people who undergird you that a fresh anointing would fall into your heart and into your spirit and into your life and that the 
essence of who you are would emanate in a fresh way again and that God would kiss you tonight. Shut <laughs> up. As only he can do. Somebody help me praise the Lord tonight. Somebody help me praise the Lord tonight. Somebody help me praise the Lord tonight. Philadelphia, I love you. I love you with my whole heart. Before I leave the stage tonight, one more time, let me hear a Philadelphia praise in this house. Ah, uh, come on and praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Look over at somebody tonight and tell them I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Glory, hallelujah. Everybody resting on your feet. Now, Lord, let your blessings rest upon every household represented, every family in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we thank you for what you have done in each and every one of us. We thank you for what you have done tonight, and we give you the glory for it. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, and throw up your hands and shout glory. Glory! Glory! glory. glory. Now turn and shake somebody's hand tonight and love them.